Welcome. Welcome to the speaker session. And today we have Judy with us. Judy, welcome and thank you for being a speaker here at Unite 2020. Um, I want to start off our conversation by asking you the inspiration behind the lines that I saw on your website, travelingjudy.com, that the goal is to die with memories, not dreams. What inspired you to write that? Well, for me, I've determined long before the pandemic ever happened that we will never have enough years in our lives to do everything that we want to do unless we plan to do that. And so I've set the objective of trying to turn as many of my dreams into memories before I leave this planet. I don't want to leave my dreams on shelves. And I would like to make the best and highest use of every day of the remaining time I have on here, and particularly post-pandemic now. That's awesome. <laughs> and you have actually done that. Um, you've traveled quite a few times to India. I have. So, so how do you describe India? I think in India is an incredible, uh, diverse country that is that creates a sensory overload it is very diverse it is complete uh, immersion into something that have you if you've never been there before is an incredible experience and somebody coined the word incredible india and mm -hmm. i really mean that seriously that it really captures the spirit of what India is all about. And India is also a place that you must accept as you see it. So you can't go to India and make judgments. You have to pack an open mind and be completely open-minded as you travel through India and see everything that you're seeing, not with the hope of changing it, but just immersing in it and enjoying it. Talking about immersing, what are, and I will not limit it to is, what are your favorite memories when it comes to India? Well, there are, there are a lot because I've been there several times. I started going back in 2005. Okay. It was my first time there. Um, and I think my, my first memory was the first trip that I did to the Golden Triangle. And for a first timer going there, I believe that that is the right way to see India first off. So you would go to Delhi and then you would move on to Agra to see the magnificent Taj Mahal and then move to Jaipur and Jodhpur and Udaipur, the lake city, and then head back to wherever you came from. But my favorite, my most memorable experience experiences were uh, on a river cruise that I did in a very remote area of India, in Assam, in northeast India, along the Brahmaputra River, on a small boat, okay. the MV Mahabahu, and, um, and there we got to immerse in the local small, tiny villages that aren't used to seeing tourists. So it was a very untouristed area of India, and that, for me, captured my heart seeing the children, seeing the weaving villages, uh, seeing the light, the light in the children's eyes as we visited the villages, where they were truly happy to welcome us into their homes and holding our hands and dragging us through mud and dirt and, and seeing how they lived without any, there was nothing that was covered up from what we, from what we were able to see. And I love that. And then also along that same trip, we went to Kaziranga mm -hmm. National Park. Okay. Which is where we did an elephant back safari. Uh, and we saw the one horned rhinos, which are rare. And mm -hmm. we, we did that as the sun was rising and the dew was coming out of the grass. And it was absolutely magical. Uh, for all of us. So there are so many things to see along there that that I have not seen in other parts of India. So it wasn't the crowded cities. So I love the crowded cities as well. 
-hmm. I love seeing the structures, the architecture, staying in the heritage hotels. But I loved the complete remoteness of Assam, which is where they grow a lot of the world's tea, by the way. Yes, they do. But after having traveled to India so many times, is Assam been your favorite so far? Or I know it's hard to choose when it comes to India. <laughs> For an Indian lover. Yeah. Yeah. It's I love, I mean, of all of the cities, I love Jodhpur. Okay. The, the uh, blue city. Mm -hmm. I love the uh, fort that is there. Okay. And walking through the city walking through the downtown core, looking at all the little shops at the bangle, the bangle makers in their little wagons, uh, and, and just seeing the cows, the animals, and the very relaxed pace of life. So of all of the cities, I would think that Jodhpur is my favorite small city. Okay. I do love Mumbai. I okay. think Mumbai is an incredible big city. It's yes. a very big city, yes. uh, but it's wonderful. And staying there, we stayed uh, all times at the uh, Taj Mahal okay. uh, Palace. And, and I recommend that because it is right there at the, uh, at the gate. Mm -hmm. And it's a phenomenal location. It's got great history. Uh, it's got very sad history, actually. Uh, yes. but, but, um, and it's got a beautiful swimming pool that you can relax in when you're tired of touring and seeing Mumbai and the bustle and the hustle of the streets, you can retreat into a gorgeous area that is quiet and secluded. Uh, but, but Mumbai has so much to offer uh, from, from the shopping to the restaurants to uh, the sites that you see, the architecture, the old colonial architecture that's there, mm -hmm. uh, the synagogues, I love visiting the synagogues. I make a point of visiting them all the time. Okay. Um, as part of as part of a visit. So I could talk about all of the cities because each one of them resonated with me uh, for various different reasons. And that's the attraction of India, is that it's so diverse. And each city, in fact, is very, very unique. And there are things to see and do everywhere. And, for people and, of all ages. And you're so right in that aspect because being born in Delhi, I did spend about five, seven years in Mumbai. And I would love to go back anytime I get an opportunity to go back to India. I like to plan a trip accidentally into Mumbai. <laughs> so I totally yes. get where you're coming from. Yes, and you mentioned Delhi. Delhi is, is a beautiful city as well. Um, I found it a little bit difficult on a couple of recent visits because of the smog that has formed there. And it's quite possible that this pandemic has helped to heal mm -hmm. a lot of the atmospheric issues. But, um, but Delhi has got great history as well. And yes, you are right. It has, uh, the pandemic has definitely cleared up the air in Delhi. Right. Um, now, a question. You're a woman who travels to India. And often I get asked about the safety concerns. I grew up in India, so the way I look at safety for women is different. But you, as a Canadian, how did you feel when you were traveling? Were you traveling alone? And so I never went to India alone. I never okay. traveled alone. I have been there with my husband. I have been there with friends and I have been there with my children okay. on different occasions. Uh, I would say that in terms of safety, I think safety is an issue no matter where you live. So in Canada, in Toronto, you have to be careful. Right. You have to understand, you have to know and understand where you are. You can just as easily take a wrong turn in Toronto as you can in other areas. Right. Um, but you have to be sensible about mm -hmm. what you're doing. You must respect the culture that you're in. You should not walk around the streets as a woman uncovered, mm -hmm. provoking a reaction to who you are and what you're doing. 
you should be covered. You should respect the local cultures. So go there and, and plan where you're going. Be planful about it and be mindful about where you're planning on going. Uh, would I be out on streets after dark in Toronto, in areas in downtown Toronto? Not likely. Not likely. Yeah. The woman. So I think that, that the same types of issues that we might experience here, we could very well experience there. I think there is an extra measure of caution for women uh, in terms of uh, traveling on their own okay. and putting themselves at risk in environments that they really can't control. So, uh, but I've never, I have never myself experienced any kind of risk, risky environment that I have been in there. I've walked the streets, I've walked the streets in the day and in the evening in the company of others and never had any thought of, of being truly at risk or being frightened or scared. Fair. And again, because I grew up in India, we've had the same experience. But as somebody born in India versus somebody just traveling to India, the perceptions could be different. So great to hear. And... Right. And you rightly put it when you're comparing it with Toronto and India. You rightly put that comparison out. I won't travel to downtown Toronto alone at night. Right. You know, so I, I don't think it's any different. If you were taking a trip to New York, you would probably exercise a certain amount of caution and, and planfulness in terms of what you are going to do there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Always. Be cautious and be aware of your surroundings wherever in the world that you're traveling, right? Exactly, exactly. Now, one thing a lot of people relate India with is cuisine. Like food, Indian food is delicious. What do you have to say about that? Have you tried Indian food? Do you like Indian food? Give us a little I, insight on that, please. I am going to confess that on my first trip, prior to my first trip to India, Okay. I never ate Indian food. Okay. And it was a concern that I had, and it's the same concern that other people have. Okay. I arrived there and I discovered that uh, the curries mm -hmm. and the uh, spices that were used there, the masala boxes, mm -hmm. were some of the tastiest. Some of the meals that I've had are the best that I've had in the world. Uh, and the diversity. And once I started to eat everything and I embraced again I embraced the local cuisine while I was there okay uh, and it's absolutely wonderful but I might add though that no matter where you are in India you can mm -hmm. get international food so within the uh, within most of the hotels whether they're heritage hotels or international hotels you could get international food anywhere so if you truly object to Indian food you will not starve in India there's ample, great food to have. Right. And um, when somebody's traveling to India, when they book a journey through one of the DMCs that I represent, my first recommendation to them is, if it comes to fruits, always have something which you can peel. Yes. Are there any personal recommendations that you would want to give a first-time traveler going to India when it comes to foods to have or avoid or things to be cautious about when it comes to eating and dining? Okay. Well, definitely you want to have bottled water and you want to have bottled water that is sealed, that you are the person that opens the seal on it. Or you can drink bottled juices or bottled uh, pop, like Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. It's the safest thing to drink there. Uh, I will not eat fresh lettuce. Okay. Okay, it comes back to, it speaks to, uh, there's too much potential there for there to be some type of contamination on the lettuce already. Your point on peeling your fruits, mm -hmm. is absolutely correct. And if you can peel vegetables, all that much better, if you're able to do that. So right. peel your vegetables, take everything that's cut, the, that's touched the surfaces. I think you also have to be careful about spices. So. If you are not used to spices and you decide that you suddenly love them and can tolerate them, 
mm -hmm. they can have a dramatic impact on your body. So everything in moderation, particularly on a first time visit to India. And then when it comes to street food, because there's a lot of interest in street food in right. India, I personally will not eat street food anywhere in the world. Okay. But my family, my husband does, my family does. I have friends who have, mm -hmm. and they've been fine. In large part, there are certain things that I would avoid on the street also. Mm -hmm. Fresh, any type of dairy products that are used um, on the street. If okay. your stomach is not used to it, don't, don't try that. Uh, and the other, the other thing is that while you walk through the markets and you see fresh meat, Mm -hmm. That is not meat that is intended to be used by a North American palate for our diets. Right. So uh, a lot of the hotels and a lot of the other commercial restaurants and properties uh, don't use that really fresh market meat. They're using meat that they're procured somewhere else because okay. that can also have an effect. You probably know a lot more about that than I do, but it can have a dramatic effect on our digestive systems. And I will second you on that because I, I moved to Canada in 2006. Um, and a lot of times, even today, when I go back, I drink only bottled water. Um, the kind of food that I eat, the street food that I used to enjoy, I am not permitted to eat that. Oh. Not by choice, but my parents. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. they, they know uh, because my system, despite being of Indian origin, my system is very much Canadian now. Yeah. Um, spices, I totally agree with you on that. The spiciness that we get here at the Indian restaurants is really different from what we get back home in India. So when in India, I always say, give me mild. Don't even give me medium spicy, give me mild. And over here, I might be saying, yep, give me spicy food. That's right. That's so, right. The other thing that I will say is, if you go to India, you must try the sweets. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I don't think I've ever seen an array of sweets that are as delicious, irresistible, as the sweets that I've seen in India. And they're really enjoyed almost all of the time. And, okay, before I ask you which one is your favorite, um, what I have realized about Indian and desserts is that we make a dessert out of everything by adding sugar. So semolina becomes a halwa, and we just add sugar and milk and ghee. Um, we take milk and we make it into different kinds of burfis if you've tried them. Um, like we from carrot halvas to all the green leafy vegetables that we, not leafy really, but green vegetables that we get here. Indians can make halva out of that very easily. <laughs> but what all have you tried? And what, what's your favorite? I, I can't recall what they're called. Okay. I've tried them all, okay? okay. I'm gonna confess, I okay. love sweets. So okay. I've tried everything. Right. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about what any of these things are called. But I do enjoy halva everywhere, okay. and, and they are remarkable in India. Yes. Have you mm -hmm. tried the lentil halva? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. You know, I'm going to take you to a little hole in the wall here in Toronto, and we are going to go on a dessert spree, Perfect. especially around Diwali. Perfect. I'll take you to an Indian hood. And you will see all of these desserts. Perfect. That we, we'll get boxed and we'll just sit somewhere and try everything. And I'll. That sounds perfect. Done deal. Sounds <laughs> done perfect. Deal. And just because you mentioned Diwali, yes. I was in India on our first trip. I was there for Diwali. Oh, nice. In and got right into the spirit of Diwali in terms of the desserts, the food, the mm -hmm. colors, the cows that were all painted uh -huh. and decorated their horns. Uh, I even bought pots, which is a tradition there, and had my name engraved. We had okay. our names engraved in all of the pots and we brought them back to Toronto with us. And I still use them. 
Yeah. Nice, yes. And, and then I returned to India for Holi. So okay. Holi is the festival of color. Correct. And, um, and that's another time that it's great foods, fabulous foods, fabulous desserts, and of course, throwing of paints all over. So I love that as well. So I've enjoyed the um, greatest of festivities as well. That's interesting because Diwali is definitely one of my favorite festivals, like the whole city, the whole country lights up. Yes. Um, and I equate it to what happens here over Christmas. Like everything looks so beautiful and so gorgeous. Yes. Um, that's what Diwali is for me when I was living in India. And I still think of, I, I hold those fond memories close to my heart. Yes. But Indians love food. So we just need a reason to eat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we eat desserts or good food. We just need that reason. Food is wonderful. The food is, food is fabulous there. Fabulous. Oh. oh, yes, true. Now, going from food to journeys, um, train. India has luxury trains. India has commuter trains. Um, India is actually, the Indian Railways is the world's eighth largest employer of people. Have you, have you ever traveled um, in India by train? Yes, I have traveled in India by train. Okay. Uh, our first visit to India, uh, I was taking a train into Agra. Okay. And um, we were in the business class section of the train. Okay. And uh, we did not have a very good experience I'm on sorry. that train. Okay. Uh, because there were some insurgents and what they did was they shot at the train and they shot the windows out. We fortunately were not hurt. I hope there was nobody else hurt on the train, but it was very unnerving to go okay. through that. Despite that, I went on a train ride again last year okay. with my family, again in the um, business class section. Okay. First class section of the car. Uh, and it was very, very busy. And we didn't know the day that we were traveling, there was a festival going on in the town that we were on our way to. Okay. So it was extraordinarily busy again. And it can be very um, claustrophobic within a train because right. there's a lot of socializing going on inside of a train car. So I think that had somebody prepared me for that better, mm -hmm. it would have been a better experience. Okay. Um, but, but I have never tried a luxury train and I would love to because I know, I have heard that the luxury trains are remarkable there. Yes, they are. And are quite an experience. I, have you done one of those? Have you been on one? I haven't. Um, actually, I have. I have uh, the Deccan Odyssey. I huh? have gotten on the train, but I haven't done a journey. Right. And the way I describe the Deccan Odyssey um, is that it's basically cruising on wheels. Right. The same concept of get on board at one station, finish the journey, and that's when you get off board. Everything is looked after. All your excursions are taken care of. So... Yes, the luxury train journeys are vastly different from what you experience. But there are a few people who like that adventure as well. Exactly. And they are willing to try um, a local train in India. And you mentioned or you said that if somebody would have prepared you. So for anybody out there who would want to explore the local Indian trains, what would be the few things that you would tell them to help them be prepared for a journey? Well, I would say um, book in the first class section, if you can afford it, book in the first class section. Okay. It's just a little bit less intense than the uh, basic category. Absolutely. I would say to plan your meal, depending on how long you're going to be on that train ride, mm -hmm. take some food with you. Mm -hmm. They do sell food on the trains. 
but if you want to take your own food, you should plan your own meal to take. You should take drinks with you on the, on the plane, on the uh, train, and, uh, and try to make yourself as comfortable as possible. So take, you don't really need sweaters mm -hmm. because it's relatively warm in there, but, uh, but make yourself as comfortable as possible. And, but definitely take your own food and drinks. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good point. And thank you for those tips. Like you, you are absolutely right. Your and own know, and know who is picking you up. Like if you're going to be picked up or where you're going when you get to the destination, mm -hmm. it's very, very important because train stations can be very busy places. Yes. It's extremely busy. Yes. And so after a, a long or even a short journey, you want to know when you arrive where it is that you're going. You want to have an address and be, uh, again, you know, have a plan in, in mind for your arrival at the next destination. Very good tip. Very good tip. And yes, India. And travel light. I mean, the other thing is yeah. travel light on a train. You have to accommodate your own bags yes. on the train. So you're going to have to put them up top or you're going to have to have them near your feet. Mm -hmm. There's very, very little room. Some trains have got a small area on the side when you board, but mm -hmm. then you have to be careful that it's there when you're leaving, depending on how many stops are in between. Right. So it's best to travel light if you can uh, right. on a train. And like you said that one should book the first class if you can afford it. Totally agree with that. But if you are not booking the first class, um, tell me if this would be a right recommendation, carry a lock and a chain to lock your luggage. Um, right. with Correct. Your don't, or, and, and don't fall yeah. asleep with your purse or your wallet um, out in the open anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, not that, I mean, I have not experienced anything bad in India, but I think they're crimes of opportunity. So if you create an opportunity for a petty crime to occur, mm -hmm. it will. Right. So don't leave anything out in the open. It's okay to go to sleep, but make sure you secure all of your belongings. And see, those who like adventure, they will be up for traveling in the commuter class and they would be interacting with the locals and they will be on a backpack. So they, they're a whole different segment of travelers. And that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And, and, uh, you know, I think that it's a great way to immerse again mm -hmm. in the country, but you have to know your comfort level. Correct. So if you don't want people directly around you in a very compressed space with people, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's not going to be a good environment. It's not going to be a good experience. Correct. Correct. And thank you for these tips. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing that I would like to have a conversation about is an opportunity to give back to the community while traveling through India, because more and more I'm seeing people who are socially conscious and when they travel, they want it to be incorporated in their journeys. Have you had that experience in India? Yes. Um, I've had that experience in several places. Okay. Uh, the two that I could mention are one time in Delhi. Okay. Went into old Delhi mm -hmm. and we went to visit an orphanage, a boys orphanage. Okay. Um, in old Delhi okay. and it was a very moving experience I mean I could easily cry right as I as I smile about it yes. but again I mean seeing those boys as happy as they seem to be with as little as they had in an environment that was challenging is an understatement but we had to duck through wires and um, just horrible conditions to get into this orphanage for starters. We were very fortunate to be allowed into the orphanage 
and we uh, made commitments to donations when we were there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that that was something that was very special and very meaningful to me. And I definitely would recommend if you're able to do those types of experiences and make donations um, to give back there, I recommend that. The second one was along the um, Brahmaputra River. Okay. Because those villages are so remote and they are poor. And I think that they are some of the poorest people, uh, but simple people in mm -hmm. India, in those villages. Uh, they're weavers. Like some of those villages were weaving villages. And we were able to go in and watch what they did. And they shared their craft with us. Um, and the, again, like the children showed us the villages and the grandparents were there. Uh, and we were able to buy and we were able to make donations there as well. So we were able to buy product, we were able to make donations, we were able to do a whole bunch of different things. What they didn't want us to do was give money because mm -hmm. the villagers there and the children there hadn't learned yet to ask for money. So they didn't welcome us with their hands out looking for for money or looking for anything else. So it was a very genuine experience that we knew that if we were buying some of the, the uh, woven products, mm -hmm. we knew that we were helping the village, but we weren't giving money in the same way. So it was a very, it was a wonderful experience. Absolutely. So, yeah, giving back in that way, just going to see them alone and sharing their story with the rest of the world is pretty incredible yes yes you're so right and sounds wonderful too like yeah, yeah. I, i'm trying not to get emotional here but well yeah. it's easy it's very easy to get emotional and it's not um it's not pity and it's not any of that it's it's that people can be so happy with so little mm -hmm. and i feel blessed i feel blessed yeah yeah, yes. it's very moving. It's a very moving experience. So every opportunity that I've had, not just in India, but in other parts of Asia, mm -hmm. uh, in particular through Myanmar and Vietnam and Cambodia, um, I've always found the opportunity to go into the smallest villages and make a difference in whatever way I could. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, before we wrap up, I have one last question for you. If there are three things to share for a first time traveler traveling to India, mm. what would those be? Decide what you want to do. Decide mm. what it is that you enjoy most about travel for starters. If you love museums, Make plans to see museums. If you like to sit and watch people and see street life, plan mm -hmm. your trip around that. But be very planful about what the trip is and your expectation. Because you're going to get the trip that you planned. Right. So, uh, and I would plan for diversity in the trip. On a first trip, I would stay within the Golden Triangle. I absolutely would do the Golden Triangle. I think it's a great sampler of what India has to offer. I would say travel light so that you can move around and you can experience various different travel methods. Even travel light internal air in India can be challenging. Mm -hmm. And yet it's very good. It's very, very efficient. Mm -hmm. But there's very little room in the cabins. Uh, if you have very little luggage, you're so much better off and they weigh everything. So uh, you cannot be over by an ounce. You will be charged for it. Your overweight in baggage in India can cost you more than your airfare. So that's one piece of advice. Very good one. Travel very lightly. Make certain that you're weighing your bag all the time, that you're not overweight. Uh, Decide on the types of hotels you like. Are you a boutique hotel person? Do you like the large international hotels? Are you open to experiencing the heritage 
properties mm -hmm. that are gorgeous and they are available throughout throughout India, everywhere you go. Um, so I, I think you again, you know, plan that. Um, what you'd like to experience, or maybe you want to plan a diversity of those experiences. And and do research. Like I know that one of the things I wanted to see were the step wells. So I made a point of making sure that wherever I was, I could see the ancient, the old step wells. And I even arranged for dinner by candlelight in one of the step wells. There had to have been a thousand candles lit. And I went by ox cart and and had and we had dinner in a in a in a in a step well that you can't experience anywhere else. So if you want unique experiences, make them happen. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. And, and, and go with an open mind. Again, you must go with an open mind to India. Please don't go with, uh, you know, ideas of what you're going to do and how you're going to change things or judge. Don't judge. Just receive. Just go there and receive with an open heart. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you for Thank you. talking about India from your perspective. Um, and I, I mean, opening it up to Q and A's if anybody wants to ask questions of you. Otherwise, I will see you again. Thank, Thank you so ready. much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye for now. Bye bye.